Do you want to know something funny? An odd, quirky bit of irony about the relationship you and I share? I feel as if you already know, if you've been listening instead of just hearing me when I talk. I worry about our communication sometimes. Communication is hard with most people. But now, I'm going to communicate a fact to you that I want you to understand and not just acknowledge. When it comes to the field of answers and interpretation, the realm of knowledge, experience, and understanding, the great unraveling of complex work and ideas and what it all means, you come to me. I'm your teacher, right? Your professor, your guide, your talking, faceless dictionary and encyclopedia, an eldritch, art house child between Wikipedia and Audible.com raised in the weird parts of the web. And yet, I'm not that. I'm no grand master of knowledge and answers. I see and I interpret to the best abilities I have based on what I do know. And all along the path of this channel, from the first night to this night, I've been learning and unlearning. See, that's the funny bit. You look to me as someone who's learned, and yet every step of the way, I learn just as much as you do, while also being shown where I'm wrong or where I haven't thought things out or learned enough. And through that, I learn more. I am not concrete. I am a growing, organic mind, still susceptible to the experiences and ravages of its journey. Your teacher is a student, and I don't think I'm ever going to truly fill the seat behind the great wooden desk the way you see me fully occupying it. I'm at the front of the room with a name plaque and the chalkboard, yes, but the chair I'm sitting on came from the same kind of desk you're sitting in right now with its rusting metal legs and plastic back held in by four old screws. We come to know others along our personal journeys who show us things in a new light, and we bear witness to work that challenges our perceptions and interpretations, even to the point of breaking our standards in ways we never anticipated. We learn, in fact, expectation is no way to approach the journey in the land of art whatsoever. Our rigid trains of thought will show us nothing beyond the offerings of places where we place down the rails according to our beliefs. And so, is it any wonder, when we step off the train and walk on foot across vast lands, we finally come to see things, even uncomfortable things, that challenge the notion of how we built our railroad. <laughs> All right, it was fun waxing poetic for a moment there in the style of Tag Man, but let's put down the theming and get into this already. It has taken entirely way too long for this discussion to take place, and I am fully aware of it. This has been ridiculous, even for me. Creating and running Night Mind has taught me a lot about the kind of work that's out there, and meeting allies and friends of the channel like Nick Spheres, Baptism on Fire, David of Midnight Marinara, and Riser of the webcomic Relief has really done just as much to broaden my horizon in the ways of understanding, approaching, and judging creative work and creators themselves. No school of thought sticks firmly to one way of doing things, so you can't hold everything to the same standard. Okay, yeah, got it. That's lesson one for sure. I think a good amount of people do manage to learn that on their own when they're in their early 20s. Each creative field has its own sort of rubric for merit because they're trying to accomplish very specific things. Cool. Okay. Got it. Each creative genre has its own sort of approach for emphasis in the way in which they go about expressing things, and you can't necessarily grade them by way of your experience with a neighboring genre. Alright, that's also pretty common knowledge, I think, but some people never do quite learn that. Each creator, in their own right, regardless of what genre or field they're in, has their own approach for emphasis and conveyance of ideas that shows up in style, characterization, and creative choices made, even down to crazy forms of presentation. And if they're defying convention or what people usually do that's effective with mainstream audiences, it's for legitimate reasons. See, now we're getting into Nick's fears and Nightmind territory of learning. And now for the big pill, which I can thank mostly Nick's fears for helping me accept and incorporate into my own system of judgment and analysis. Each creator has within them a major range of intentions, messages, styles, and movements for execution and presentation that can and will show up in ways and situations that baffle us, and, in the most shocking circumstances, might completely clash with their prior work, even down to an author presenting sequential pieces under the same intellectual property line that feel wrong to us. And it can be more than justifiable, it can be smart, even if we don't get what they were trying to do for many years. The main takeaway from all of this when it comes to judging creative endeavors? 
Expectations are your enemy. Each piece of work, be it an independent body or something attached to a previous installation, has its own mission and intention, its own rubric that is informed by its genre, its style, and what its creator intends to make, and it can only really be judged by virtue of how well it achieved the desired concept outlined by its author, despite general audience reaction. It doesn't matter if the creator is a baker who you've always known to make awesome pies and then suddenly they try a cake. You cannot huff and puff about it because you know the person making it specializes in pie. Cake isn't even that far off from pie. Can you really expect them to not try both at some point? You must judge the cake and accept it as its own effort without the rubric and standards created by the baker's previous pie creations. And as viewers, we need to throw expectations associated with pie work aside. In essence, an author presenting something new that's been part of them all along but isn't quite like their prior work should not be shunned. It's not a pie, but they still made you a cake. So, you know. Shut up and eat your cake. Why am I doing all of this tongue wagging about standards and creative intention? Because while we never really do know what to expect from Wham City Comedy, we'd all be liars if we said we didn't have expectations of them as creators and their work. Myself especially. The Nightmind channel has grown up with Wham City. Their work is the first field I entered after pushing through the Sunderman Woods here on YouTube, which is where I began making videos and had a serious risk of being pigeonholed as a specialist for it if I didn't make it clear I was just opening with that territory. I planted a flag expressing the wider scope of what I wanted to cover and represent by reviewing Alan's tutorial and unedited footage of a bear, and those two pieces really had an impression on me. And you guys too, who responded with just as much passion as I felt. And of course, we have this house as people in it, which took all of the alternate reality game puzzle box elements covered in my first two Wham City related videos and doubled down on them, creating a rabbit hole that kept me awake for over 24 hours twice in one week trying to solve it. And even when it comes to Children of the Mirror, we had some light puzzle work to do, analyzing a secret video and really thinking about the hidden code of Curtis, a pretty intense cult leader who based his teachings on science fiction and cosmic horror. When the majority of you think of Wham City comedy, I know you think of the material that's online first. I'm sure that a lot of you forget that they go on tour and put on live shows, and you might even disregard the comedy portion of their name, because in your experience, the brainy, intellectual, art house mystery content always seems to outshine the humor. But if you dig into their history and you go to their shows, which I have done twice now, you find that they are every bit as passionate about performing and having a fun time playing characters, taking bold new approaches to comedy and entertainment, and just putting on a good show as they are excited about building intellectual mazes with walls made of cryptic symbols for us to run through. Wham City Comedy are two sides of an emotional mental spectrum. They are the big wham that hits you in the brain and has you staring at the ceiling doing mental gymnastics for hours. And they're the comedy style you expect from Adult Swim, presenting insane, hilarious caricatures of people and impossible situations that the creators and viewers enjoy immensely. The issue we've got right now is that there's never been such a heavy bleed over from the touring comedy half to the recorded, widespread, Nightmind's gonna cover this and spend two hours explaining it half. <laughs> And it's only an issue because of the tendency I was getting into with my speech earlier. Expectations. If you haven't seen Cry of Man, Adult Swim has an archive of all the episodes that aired live on their website. I will put the link in the video description below and pin it in the comments. And here's a bit of direction for you right on the screen as well. Start with episode 1, go to episode 2 after that, and then watch the corresponding episode of Tanking Man after that, which has only 6 episodes. This is going to take some time to watch, so make the time and get to it. The work was fantastic, and you would be depriving yourself of a great experience and a lot of context if you only watch my coverage. Not to mention disrespecting the phenomenal effort of everybody involved in making Cry of Man, which was a huge undertaking. I'll wait here as usual. Go watch it, then come back to me when you're done. Alright, you ready? Good, let's continue. Like I said, expectations are the issue at play here and I'm sure none of you were expecting something quite like that. Much more Children of the Mirror, a lot less this house has people in it, right? I hear you loud and clear, caller. The Cry of Man, if you couldn't tell already, was a live interactive event over the course of eight nights, broadcast from Adult Swim Studio at the end of October into the first few days of November. You could call a number and get on the air to talk to members of the family, potentially influencing events as they happened and maybe changing the outcome of the soap opera style tale unfolding in live time. Meanwhile, viewers could also interact with each other and certain spirit characters like Ghost Lady and the villain, Georgiev, through the livestream chat client on Adult Swim's website. The premise was very simple. The Man family has a bunch of issues, they don't know what phones are, but they'll pick up anyway and talk to the mysterious voices from beyond watching their every move. You. 
This project is every bit as genius and bold as it is incredibly dangerous for a creator with a vision, because Wham City had to trust callers to not destroy the whole thing and actually play along. And for the most part, incredibly, things worked out. The entire event is very much a performance instead of a puzzle. From the very first night, I felt like I was visiting a Wham City comedy show, because it's so much like what they put on during their tours. It's lively, it's heavy on character and dialogue, it's silly and crazy and dripping with an atmosphere of people having dumb fun with an absurd content and enjoying every second of it, it involves audience interaction to a light degree, and it's got plenty of improv. Trust me, if you liked Cry of Man at all, you are going to love a Wham City comedy live show. Do not miss them on tour, because this is precisely the kind of stuff you get, and more. But that's just the thing. What we have in The Cry of Man is Wham City Comedy's live show material presented as purely for a broad online audience as possible for the first time. We saw a good sample of it in Children of the Mirror, but this is breaking down the wall even further and really introducing the rest of who they are to everybody who doesn't already know. Does this mean that for once there's nothing for us to dissect, analyze, and obsess over? Is there no puzzle box here? Was it all just Adult Swim-style entertainment done with a touch of live call-in show fun? Don't worry. You've already seen the runtime of this video. You know there's a little something in this for us. <laughs> Which I'm sure you did sense at certain points. But mostly, you don't need me and my abstract art forensics kit to help you figure this one out. And honestly, that's a bit of the reason why it's taken so long for me to get around to talking about this on top of Halloween content burnout and a bout of seasonal illness. I've been giving this one time to sit in my brain, while also doing a lot of research, stopping to simmer while my mind tried to reconcile the relationship between reference material and content, and then going back to active research. When you're used to having a big box of puzzle pieces to work with in two prior cases and come to fully anticipate that you need to be ready to do that every time, you sort of end up staring at the conspiracy theory wall for way too long concerning new work that, honestly, doesn't need nearly as much thought as before. You don't see things jumping out at you, so you stare a little bit harder and longer, waiting to catch the pattern that you're missing, and then you realize there's no pattern to be seen. In this case, the content is the context. I had to stop staring at blank spaces asking myself why I couldn't see connecting lines. There weren't lines where I was looking to connect. The Cry of Man has very overt, very obvious themes that are the main takeaway in my opinion. We have a major concept piece in the form of a phone, which nobody in this world understands and is the giant, crazy part of this whole experience. We get to call in and talk to these characters, potentially affecting everything. You get to, in a way, touch the art and be part of it, through a phone. Meanwhile, the Mann family has constant contact with the mailman, who, on top of bringing everyone in this town correspondence through letters, brings the family in particular audio tapes from their missing father figure, Tank Man. Tank records tapes on his journey, giving long, poetic monologues, and the family sits and listens. There's no return address, so they can't actually respond to him. The family is afraid of receiving a red letter that will spell disaster for them. Meanwhile, Courtney Mann has been using yellow letters to get her way in the world. And Drool Day, the big holiday everybody is looking forward to, involves a custom of using blue letters to celebrate the season. Phones, audio tapes, letters, and the prominence of a mailman character. I wonder what the theme we're supposed to focus on here could be. Should I make it even clearer by highlighting how Jack Mann, the first member of the family poisoned by the villain character, has a paranormal tooth placed inside of his ear? A piece of somebody's mouth, the part of the body that speaks, put into another person's ear, the part that listens. How much clearer with your visual symbols do you guys want to get? How about this really beautiful shot in Frank's first meeting with Georgiev that you absolutely know at this point was totally on purpose? The big, scary, paranormal spirit infecting everybody with his mouth, talking at Frank's ear. It doesn't get much better than this for symbols that serve as thesis statements. Communication, kids. This one is all about communication. Or it's complete and utter breakdown as we see very few conversations of real impact take place between characters. And when they do have impact, the results are often harsh, painful, unwanted. And yet, they can be helpful. But what kind of communication are we bearing witness to, other than plenty of moments of seriously unsuccessful conversation? That's where we begin to approach territory that's not so easily picked up just by watching, and the further we go into examining it, the closer we come to highlighting the most likely lens through which the author sees the chosen theme. Let's start from the top here, and address something that I know is on your mind that bears approaching early. In the reality of the show, we see a lot of the color orange. Everything that is paranormal is colored orange. Ghost Lady is orange, Jurjiev is partly orange, the phones are orange, and characters who are poisoned by Jurjiev's evil force become tainted or obsessed with orange. 
During moments of spiritual havoc, we see the color orange highlight the set, and when a character dies, their attire becomes orange. You can find a few other colors at play here too. Red, yellow, blue, white, and black, but none are as prominent as orange. The paranormal nature of this color is confirmed by Frank, servant of Georgiev, who tells a listener, that color is neither here nor there. By virtue of its relationship with orange, the concept of communication is a paranormal force, as are its effects on people. Viewers who called in had a rough time actually speaking with these characters for sure, but I think it's really fair to say that when they called in, they had the most legitimate focus and attention of the character who picked up the phone. These characters and their interactions usually just talk at each other, quite often in long, drawling spouts of heavy emotion. When a phone is picked up, a character often asks a question and then actually waits for the response of a viewer. When that response is given, the character then seems to really work off of it. Things did not have to be this way. Everyone on stage is a very talented improv actor who could have barreled over callers with their own intended dialogue if necessary. Instead, there's conversation, especially between Courtney and her callers, and Jack Mann and his. Jack Mann, who had a nasty orange tooth planted right in his ear, is the closest to his callers and really takes to calling them by name, receiving them warmly, asking for their help and participation. He doesn't really have his guard up around callers, unlike members of the family who haven't been directly infected by Georgiev. The Gift of Communication the actual ability to listen and wait and exchange dialogue on a somewhat equal level instead of just talking at a person to get your way and exerting your feelings. That is what's really being seen as paranormal here. Jack and Courtney don't even need phones to speak to callers once they're infected because the gift of communication is inside of them now. Everybody else needs a phone and when they pick up, they're either incredibly on guard or very insistent in talking to a caller about their own needs. So. Why do I keep on insisting that communication as a true two-way street is paranormal in the cry of man instead of, say, mystical? Why choose the heavier, more negative, more cryptic and dangerous way to refer to this instead of a lighter, more positively mysterious way? Well, for one thing, we see the effect it actually has on Courtney and Jack, turning them into crazy, vengeful, obsessive versions of themselves that are unrecognizable from who they were before, and Frank isn't doing too great himself after hanging around Georgia for so long. The characters also start off answering the phones very slowly, fearfully, in ways they show they don't quite understand what's happening, but don't welcome this. And of course, we have the great mid-story conflict height of Jack's art show, where the family reacts to his depictions of phones with the utmost horror and disgust. They're attracted enough to phones when ringing and they don't have much time to think about answering, but when put boldly on display right in front of them, phones cut right to the core of terror and repulsion inside members of the Mann family. On a surface level watching all of this, I think it's really easy to get it. Communication and lack of it as the major theme in The Cry of Man is obvious. Its nature as being paranormal and dangerous to people when successfully performed is obvious. And if we didn't get all of that just by watching the show itself, then the after show Tanking Man gives the game away. Tanking Man is a rip on hit drama spin-off talk shows like The Talking Dead, which hypes up the major series The Walking Dead. In Tanking Man, we have two women named Rebecca who try to constantly skirt the fact that they don't even watch Cry of Man, and instead of talking about the show, which is what something like Tanking Man should be for, they instead discuss their own lives and make terrible, awkward small talk. We'll be touching on Tanking Man more in a little bit, but I wanted to stop here quickly to highlight its main support of the major theme in Cry of Man, while also pointing out that it's not subtle in helping us acknowledge what we're looking for as critical viewers. See that book on the coffee table? This would be the Book of Symbols. Yes, really. In a Wham City comedy project, they have put front and center for us to see, in the first episode of Tanking Man, a Cry of Man discussion show, a reference guide called The Book of Symbols. I really love that. Never think that Wham City doesn't know who their audience is. And you know, there are symbols in Tanking Man for us to catch. Mostly they connect to the outside reference material, but they do exist, and once I touch on those we can come back around full circle to the big centerpiece of Tanking Man, Sam Weiner, who plays a fictionalized version of himself that is, in the words of Ancient Martinez, A PANDA Here's what you need to catch in Tanking Man for the beginning of symbol referencing. A book titled Atlas Obscura, which is about visiting the weirdest and most paranormal places in the world. A book called Ichthyo, the architecture of fish, a book called Reef, and a statue of a fish. Why all the references to fish and water? Maybe it has to do with all the references by Frank, Georgiev's assistant, to water. He seems to have a bit of an obsession with it, asking viewers coded questions like, What's the difference between a rock and a reef? The rock and a reef? What's the difference between a rock and a reef? 
And the reef is underwater. It's what's inside that counts. Listen to what I'm about to say very carefully. You can write it down. Do you have a pen and paper? Yes, I do. There is no difference between the lake and the sea. There is no difference between the lake and the sea. Do you see the lake? I see the lake. Where is the tide? The tide is on the coast. Doesn't make much sense, does it, Frank's coded language? Not until we're told of his secret backstory by Agent Martinez later, describing how Frank drowned as a boy and then returned to the shore, apparently in a very unnatural way. This is confirmed by Georgiev later on, forcing Frank to relive his drowning experience as he reveals that he was the reason Frank drowned, holding the boy under the waves until he died, and then releasing him, undead, back to the world of the living, his paranormal existence noticed only by enough people to start up some rumors in town. Is that all for Frank's water-based questions, though? If that was his only obsession, why would we get such oddly specific questions after them, asking about the names of three men, and whether or not the caller had ever stayed in a particular hotel? And what was all that business concerning a key and a gate? This is where the vein of hidden material that needs puzzle-solving lies, and it's kind of a deep hole to dive into. If you knew enough to catch it as Frank talked, then you were lucky. And if you weren't, then you'd have to do a lot of work on Google in order to get it. I wish I had an instant connection point where the average viewer could strike the line they needed from here to start telling you, but it does not exist, so I'm just going to have to lay it all out here. Frank, portrayed by Robbie Ratcliffe, is using coded questions that reference the writing of H.P. Lovecraft. Considering that Robbie also wrote and directed The Cry of Man, this shouldn't really surprise you. Robbie also wrote and directed The Children of the Mirror, while playing its cult leader character Curtis, whose code was comprised of information taken from a story by Frank Belknap Long, a writer who was a friend and collaborator with H.P. Lovecraft. The two shared fictional universe material, incorporating each other's ideas at time in their own stories to create a connected world of cosmic horror. The H.P. Lovecraft references are very strong, and when you read the material being called on, you can see why. In fact, reading a good deal of Lovecraft beyond the stories touched upon gives you perspective you otherwise would have never had. When Frank asks a viewer for the three names he needs to hear in order to spare Juglet's life, he wants to know the last name of a rich man named Obed, the first name of a man growing in a farmhouse, and the real name of a missing man named Ward. The answers are Marsh, Wilbur, and Kerwin. Captain Obed Marsh is the rich patriarch of the Marsh family from the story The Shadow Over Innsmouth. There's a chance of missing the target on Wilbur because of the ambiguous nature of the question, but if you think about it, Frank was just clever in his wording. Wilbur Waitley is the name of a man growing completely out of proportion to the normal growth rate and size of a human while living in a farmhouse, and he comes from the tale The Dunwich Horror. The third question is one you can't possibly miss due to how specific it is and how only one story could possibly fit. Charles Dexter Ward, the man who goes missing in The Case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft, was actually an imposter named Joseph Kerwin. Marsh, Wilbur, Joseph Kerwin. Those are the names that we needed, and they were found in Lovecraft's writing. Want to know what else was found in Lovecraft? When Frank asks what color is the key, he's referencing a story literally titled The Silver Key, featuring Lovecraft's only consistent hero character, Randolph Carter. The story that the Silver Key is directly connected to in the writing, Through the Gates of the Silver Key, is what Frank is asking about next when he asks, what color is the gate? The answer to that one is kind of tough to give because it could have technically been gray based on the appearance of the first gate in that story, or it could have been impossible to give based on the second gate in that story. Personally, I would have told him all and none, because that's the best shot you have by Lovecraft's description in the work. I'll confess that I don't know who the man is that's singing in the cave, or the one running in the cave. It's possible that the man in the pit is Harley Warren, who comes from the first story featuring Randolph Carter titled The Statement of Randolph Carter, though I'm certain there are plenty of Lovecraft stories I've yet to read about somebody in a pit. The difference between a rock and a reef may be a second reference to the Shadow of Ernsmith, due to the existence in that story of Devil Reef, where it really does matter what's on the inside, as Frank says. In this case, devils. I can't tell you the difference between a lake and the sea, but I can tell you that there was a third reference to the Shadow of Ernsmith. When Frank claims to have stayed in a hotel run by people with wide eyes, he's talking about the only hotel in the town of Innsmouth, the Gilman House, which is definitely run by people with some very wide eyes and is a central set piece in the tale. I'm also realizing as I say Gilman House now that that was probably a joke by H.P. Lovecraft when it comes to the actual plot of The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Huh. Funny man. And if that's not enough for you when it comes to references to Lovecraft stories pertaining to the sea, how about this? 
When Frank is talking to Georgiev in the living room using the vase, Georgiev mentions the time that he called to Frank over the water at Martin's Beach. It turns out that H.P. Lovecraft made a story with another writer that was called The Horror at Martin's Beach, and it has to do with people being dragged into the ocean and drowned by something terrifying. By the way, that whole thing with the vase in the living room, it's most likely a reference to the story The Terrible Old Man, about a wizard recluse who has a load of bottles with small objects hanging inside that can be seen in his living room. Remember how this vase that Frank can talk into now had a tooth placed in it on a string by Jojiev? Check out this quote from the story The Terrible Old Man. These folks say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles, and each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string, and they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles. And wait, there's more. During monologues by Jurchiev, he mentions a place called The Last Redoubt. Do a quick search and you find The Last Redoubt is a building mentioned in the novel The Nightland by William Hope Hodgson, which Lovecraft praises heavily as a personal inspiration in an essay he wrote, Supernatural Horror in Literature. And that word that Frank keeps mentioning, of a place, Uriab, he's spelling it wrong. The name is actually Oriab, with an O, and it's a location found in the dream world of Randolph Carter, detailed in the story, The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. And finally, there is a rather obvious thought that you can come up with about the possibility of the color orange being the color out of space in Lovecraft's story by the same name, which relates to a form of radiation that causes death by rotting mutation in human beings. I'm less sold on this idea because the characters in that story shrivel up and seem to turn into living, moldy zombies until succumbing to death instead of undergoing a crazy transformation, like Courtney and Jack, but it is still a fun reference if it was intentional. Personally, I find a lot more connection between The Cry of Man and the Lovecraft story From Beyond, about a man invited to the house of a scientist friend who has created a device that allows him to see and hear evidence of a paranormal world around him. That machine allows them to see ultraviolet light, giving them a view of a color that's out of this world. Considering the power and paranormal nature of the telephone in Cry of Man, I'm much more inclined to lean on From Beyond than The Color Out of Space as a potential reference. There's also the existence of a sort of humming music that appears whenever something truly paranormal happens in The Cry of Man, and the vibratory tones that are heard when the machine is turned on in From Beyond. And finally, finally, let's not overlook the heavy use of monologues with long, unnecessary descriptions throughout The Cry of Man, especially coming from Tank Man, who records them all on audio tapes, a method very reminiscent of the way that Lovecraft had so many of his characters relay their experiences in first person. If tape recording had been readily available in HP's time, I have absolutely no doubt that he would have employed it as a found record writing device instead of always having you, the reader, discover the lost diary entry or the lost letters of somebody who went through a terrible ordeal. Lovecraft was a brilliant man, but he had a really bad habit of overdoing it on descriptions of locations and silly things that did not need to be written about for the story. If you read a good amount of his work, you are going to find yourself skimming over literal paragraphs telling you things you just don't need to know or quite often, things that Lovecraft already expressed to you in one or two sentences. He would have benefited from Stephen King's philosophy, kill your darlings. Thankfully, his bad habit of tending towards moments of purple prose benefits us here, because we can see it reflected all throughout Cry of Man as characters monologue, tank man monologues, and we sit and wonder when they're going to get to the point. Even the title of the project, The Cry of Man, sounds like a lost H.P. Lovecraft story. This whole thing is drenched in Lovecraft from head to toe, even when it comes to characterizing members of the family. The evil heiress, the impressive rich businessman, the oddball artist who easily becomes attached to the paranormal, the soldier, and the stark, humorless government officials who actually take every crazy thing reported to them shockingly seriously. And Georgiev? Oh, he is the most Lovecraftian element in here by far. The guy is just a man who got lost in the void outside the protection of Earth and witnessed the chaos of existence, went totally mad, and came back poisoned. He's been touched by insanity, and being mentally warped, latched onto the man family as an obsession, convincing himself he can undo the world and make his darkness go away by killing Tank Man. Does that make sense? No. But that's what so many of Lovecraft's horrors from the outside want to break into our world and decimate what humanity has built, because they hate it and they hate us. Lovecraft's stories are full of ordinary people who make contact with Eldritch forces and become their agents, working against their own world for power and riches, just like Frank. In fact, that's an underlying theme in The Shadow Over Innsmouth, which seems to be the heaviest inspiration for Cry of Man. The story even features a railroad quite prominently. And so what? So what if there is heavy allusion to Lovecraft all over the place? What does that actually mean? Why do we care? Why is it important? Let's circle back to where we left off looking at Tanking Man and the idea of the author's lens for this project's message. 
In tagging man, we have three issues, the first of which was already discussed and would be obvious to anybody watching. It's a discussion show that is not even trying to do its job. The Rebeccas aren't talking about Cry of Man. They only do it when they feel they have to. They don't even watch the show. They're terrible and highlight the concept of awful communication or complete lack of it. We also have an issue of Tanking Man being an exploitation vehicle. It's using the heat from Cry of Man to grab a sponsorship from La Colombe, a draft latte drink. The first appearance of La Colombe shows off their pumpkin spice flavor, sporting orange lids and coloring on the can. It shows up the same time as some of the orange phones from the set of Cry of Man, giving us a bit of a boost in noticing the color coding here. La Colombe is now seen to be in the same category as the Force's colored orange. It's paranormal. It's out of this realm. It's Lovecraftian. We've seen good in the form of Ghost Lady, we've seen bad in the form of Jerjiev, and we've seen a mix in ourselves coming through the phones. But mainly, we can associate Orange with a dangerous, powerful Lovecraftian force. La Colombe shows up right around the time that there's a bit of drama offset in the overall story of Crav Man. Yes, it really does go beyond the stage show, incorporating a fake feud between Wham City Comedy and the creators of Tanking Man. Wham City reports after the first airing of Tanking Man that it's unofficial and not to be supported. The guest on that show, Sam Weiner, who plays the mailman, was not even their first choice to play the mailman and is generally indicated to be somebody that they don't want to associate with. Viewers were told not to watch Tanking Man. And please, bear in mind that this was all part of the story concocted as the whole Cry of Man experience. I got so many tweets from you guys being genuinely concerned that it was actual drama. <laughs> Never trust something like this to be real when it comes to a Wham City project, guys. You gotta play along until it's over. After the next episode of Cry of Man, Tanking Man does come back, once again with the guest from the first night, Sam Weiner, who assures us that everything is fine. There's a tweet from Wham City saying that they're all cool, and he shows us on his phone as well during Tanking Man. Now, here comes a fun bit of info. This episode of Tanking Man opened with a legal header. Tanking Man is in no way affiliated with or endorsed by the creators of the Cry of Man, AP Video Solutions, and Wham City. It falls under fair use statutes and is thus protected by numerous Supreme Court decisions in both Americas and many international nations as well. The current state of intellectual property law, IP law, gives the AP Video Solutions no legal recourse against the creator slash producer of Tanking Man, Sam Weiner. This isn't just something Adult Swim put on after Cry of Man in the context of the story. This is a deliberate charade by the fictional version of Sam Weiner, the mailman character, to steal heat from Wham City and promote himself while also potentially getting paid for it. But here's the thing. If Sam had tricked Adult Swim into allowing Tanking Man at first and it was entirely his deal, then he would have been shut down in the story after Wham City spoke to Adult Swim. Both Wham City and Adult Swim would have been taken advantage of, and they would have nodded at each other in sympathy before kicking Sam out the door with both their feet. Instead, we have Tanking Man still airing and forced assurance in written and photo form from Wham City that everything's fine and they support Tanking Man. It doesn't quite seem that Sam is actually the one in power here. And the very next night, we seem to confirm that, as another bit role character actor is invited on the show instead. Right in time for La Cologne to appear as an obvious sponsor. Sam himself calls into the show and we're informed by the obviously repulsed Rebecca's that he wasn't booked tonight. If Sam Weiner did own the show, he wouldn't be having this problem, would he? And he certainly wouldn't have such trouble getting back on over the next few nights, which he clearly does. Meanwhile, the Rebeccas appear to get more draft lattes that they obviously don't enjoy drinking. The fictional Sam Weiner arc runs deeper than this, however. His behavior extends to the actual set of Cry of Man when he seems to bribe a light operator to give him a literal spotlight, which he gets right into before delivering a long, winding monologue that's entirely out of place. He takes similar moments later to overstay his welcome as the mailman, forcing himself into being a more prominent member of the cast. Having the tanking man and Sam Weiner angle really complicated my attempt to decipher this whole thing. Watching the cry of man, you get it, no problem. Even without the Lovecraft references being understood, you can take away the core message. Add in tanking man though, and that really messes up comprehension. Until you begin to draw parallels backed up by the Lovecraft material. You do not need HP Lovecraft knowledge to understand Cry of Man and its over themes, and you definitely don't need to have read his work to enjoy Cry of Man. You do need Lovecraft by your side when it comes to seeing the micro or sub themes within Cry of Man, however, to see the lens through which the concept of communication or issues with it is being presented. Manipulation through communication, or communication with powers that mean to undermine you, are what I pick up from the Cry of Man. There is much to gain from actual communication in terms of reward but there is equally as much to lose in being sold a lie. 
Hijacking a person's mentality by putting the rotten, poisonous content of your mouth right into their ear is such a hardcore Lovecraftian theme. You can detect it in at least half of his stories. HP wrote a lot about communicating with forces beyond the comprehension of humanity, and in many stories, including those referenced by Frank, people suffer for it or pay in several ways for what they take from eldritch beings. Meanwhile, there are elements of Lovecraft's writing suggesting that, while there is much danger on the outside, not all of it is evil or does mean harm. Manipulation through communication can occur regarding ordinary people speaking ill to each other about wizards and occult researchers, claiming that they're evil when, in fact, they're not dabbling in anything too dangerous. Frank obviously suffers for his communication with Georgiev. Georgiev, seemingly once human, has paid ten times as much as Frank for whatever he messed with that led him outside of Earth's natural realm. And if he's based on any of the dark wizards in Lovecraft's writing, he definitely had talks with monsters who manipulated him. Jack and Courtney are equally manipulated by Georgiev once poisoned with communication power. And outside of the set, Sam Weiner manages to pull one over on Adult Swim and Wham City, manipulating both for his own gain and then selling us, the viewers, a very heavy lie on the first episode of Tanking Man. But, to quote a word of caution shared with Joseph Kerwin by one of his cohorts in the case of Charles Dexter Ward, do not call up any that you cannot put down. It seems that in trying to manipulate Adult Swim, the highest power in this tale, Sam Weiner was struck down, having the show legally taken from him and then used to turn a profit in spite of the opportunistic actor. Only Adult Swim could have made the situation run as smoothly as it did and still have it backfire only on Sam. And in a legal sense, you could definitely see them being able to just completely take what Sam offered based on him using fraud to get his way. Sam being the mailman character and the manipulation force outside the show seems like a perfect fit, seeing the overall theme of communication and one of its extreme downfalls. People can benefit from communicating and actually listening instead of just talking at each other, yes, but they can also be manipulated by a lying, opportunistic troll or an orange-toothed freak promising riches. The same goes for us, the viewers, who have the power to call in and potentially affect the story at any turn. We could help through our communication, or we could make things much worse by lying and manipulating characters. Often viewers… well, often viewers totally drop the ball, to be honest. It's kind of a miracle that the caller chosen to give Ghost Lady the ultimate story-saving instruction was sharp enough to say smash the vase, effectively being the one true hero of the eight-night event. We all know that the Barry Madden Agent Martinez love story was an event destroyed at its clear decision point by an influential call. But worst of all, we kill Juglet. We kill that poor boy dead, and Robbie and Cricket tell us in no uncertain terms through Frank and Courtney that it definitely did not have to go down like that, and yes, it's our fault. I need you to take me to my room! Just hold on a second, baby! I'm just trying to figure out something. I'm trying to figure out if this is the real ending. Is that Juglet? Yeah. Did he have to die? I don't think so. Yeah, we failed that quick time event really, really badly. And I do mean we. Because as much as communication had an impact on the story for those who called in, it had equal, if not more, importance between viewers who could have been callers. All throughout the eight-night event, I kept noticing in the livestream chat that somebody was plugging a Cry of Man discussion subreddit. I took a look once or twice, saw that it was nice enough with a small handful of people posting, but it really was a small turnout in comparison to the actual viewership for Cry of Man. There were a few threads, mostly made by the same posters, with little replies made, Admirable, even if results weren't equal to the effort. But in hindsight, that's where we all went wrong. It should have been pretty obvious watching Tanking Man that discussing things, actually holding communication in the face of a show that was billed as doing just that and ignoring its responsibility, was our task. We, the viewers, were meant to be Tanking Man. It was our job to see the giant, glaring issue of a world in which people couldn't stop their stupidity and selfishness and actually talk with each other and know that, of course, it's a hideous reflection of our own. We could have come together on that subreddit that somebody cared enough to open, found the Lovecraft connection as a community, and made an effort for those calling in to be fully prepared for whoever they were about to deal with. Instead, we were only watching together, while still standing apart. Juglet is dead because we failed to comprehend the meaning behind Cry of Man that was so plainly obvious from the premiere night. And as much as it hurts to admit it, I feel partially responsible for this. I could have helped with that rally point and tried to generate a place to congregate and put things together. Instead, I felt that my position would be most respectful in this case through keeping my distance, only popping up a bit in the livestream chat. I never even called in. The idea of it felt like intruding. 
Ironically, that didn't stop me from getting on the show later as an art piece taped to Courtney Mann's bed, which was a very cool easter egg. Big shout out to the artist behind that and whoever put me on set for a while. But yes, I think we messed up. If we had come together, it could have been a happier Trill Day. I'm not completely dissatisfied with the ending though, seeing how Tank Man survived and the family, apart from Jugglet, has mended a bit and come together. It does raise a point people have been asking me about though, Tank Man's sit down with viewers. Callers who got on the line with Tank Man were able to speak with him, in a very deflective, ineffective way. He would greet them kindly, ask them what their question is, and then, no matter what they said or asked, he would offer them a question to instill introspection in the viewer, or turn their own question back on them. For instance, a viewer who asked, what color is the key, was asked in reply, what color do you think the key is? Other viewers got repeat questions and inquiries like, when does your memory begin? Tell me about your self-care routines. Have you ever climbed a mountain? Tell me about your childhood. Tell me about the last person who hurt you. Where does the past live? When was the last time you cried? Tell me one good thing, anything in your life that is good to you. Tank Man is simultaneously a pastor and a poet, all while embodying the image of a strong, dependable father, which he has been anything but during this time. Anytime he is accused of wrongdoing or leaving his family, he says, I understand, or something equally agreeable but non-committal. He's ultimately a therapist figure, bringing any conversation around to an objective of getting a caller to open up and potentially talk at length about themselves. It's really the first time something of this nature happens during the course of the show, and like the dual nature of communication throughout, it feels like there can be equal good and equal bad in the message conveyed through this. Tank is redirecting communication to occur amongst one party, you, with yourself. This moment is like a confessional in a church, and in the way that Tank pushes you to look inward and examine your emotions and thoughts, he's illustrating what he's been out in the world doing this whole time, finding himself. Everybody knows how to talk at someone. Next, they learn how to talk with someone, hopefully. Last, they may become capable of talking with themselves, a seemingly advanced stage of communication experience. This is my good side interpretation of the moment. My bad side interpretation is that Tank may be exhibiting the inverse of other family members with communication issues. He'll drive you to speak, understanding that you need to talk, but he won't do it himself. He is closed off from you because he's giving you the entire floor, rather than taking it all for himself, as others often do while talking. This is equally unhealthy and just runs in the opposite way. When Tank is done taking questions, the screen fades to black and we're left with several minutes of coastal noises, a reminder of Frank and the Lovecraftian themes that we can find in the work, if a viewer picked up on them. We close on this subtle reminder of our power and our place in the work, a nod to the way we acted like Lovecraft's eldritch beings breaking in from the void, playing with members of the Man family for better or worse in a communication game that ultimately left one member dead, two of them horribly warped, and all of them forever disturbed and grieving. It's a metaphorical sort of reference, you see. Man learns powerful secret of true communication. Man becomes haunted by all-knowing voices from the beyond. Man turns irreversibly mad. And meanwhile, one of the Eldritch forces of the communication realm has a sick obsession with destroying man and all that man has built. It's Lovecraftian as you can get without making a Cthulhu reference and giving the whole game away. Communication has the ability to heal and to hurt, and oftentimes it's used to manipulate, deceive, and poison healthy minds. Poison can be made with the mouth and slip past somebody's defenses after a poisoner convinces somebody that they're on the same side. All it really takes is one crazy, stupid, malicious, ignorant orange talk box filled with evil intent spewing venom in an otherwise normal person's ear to twist them, corrupting someone until they've changed their entire character or belief system to suit new ideas based on lies, uneducated opinions, and selfish agendas. And yet, in certain cases, someone can experience the great part of the void beyond the knowledge of man, receiving words of wonder, enrichment, positivity, encouragement, and guidance for their betterment. But mainly, eldritch creatures like us appear to be far more nervous and confused while interacting with man than they are with us. Hello. Hello? Yes. Yes? No, no, please. Do you know who you're talking to right now? Do you know? Do you have no. any idea who you're talking to right now? Do you? No. You don't have any idea? You've never heard of me? No. Then why are you talking to me? What is this? You, you sound know. like a man, but you look like a machine. <laughs> no, uh, A giggly machine with nothing to say. You bore me. 
Yes, I think that the real sense we can take away from this project is that true communication is kind of paranormal, and equally as dangerous as it is helpful. We live in a world today that seems crippled by an issue of nobody wishing to actually talk with each other. And even when they do, there's so much of a push by one side or another to twist the other person into the shape they want. To just get their way instead of reaching the grounds of knowledge and understanding. Everyone just wants to spit their own emotionally charged, me-first opinions and feelings at others and drown them out. And when the opposition or the partner in conversation speaks, the silent party isn't actually listening. They're just thinking of what they're going to say next or what words and phrases they can latch onto by the other person to use against them so they can further their point. Nobody wants to talk. Nobody wants to have real conversations. Nobody wants to listen and have true communication to reach solutions. I think this issue is best represented in Cry of Man during the Jack transformation arc when he's furious after the failure of his art show. Even though a ton of voices come through asking Jack why he's angry and how they can help, all he keeps doing is screaming about how mad he is and shuts them all down. Even the point we explored earlier about our own failure as a community to communicate highlights this core theme. We couldn't come together. We chose not to. We didn't communicate. And because of that, Juglet's dead, Barry and Agent Martinez never hooked up, and we missed out on whatever other changes we were able to affect with our calls. I mean, can you please talk to me? Why are you going to ask me to come down here if you're not even going to talk to me, huh? I wish we were doing something else. All I've done since I've gotten back is talk and listen. Talk and listen. You talk, I listen. I talk, you listen. What is that? Will you ever be my dream again? Tank man. Yes. We need to have a very, very long time. We were the singular, crazy voices of the void. A cataclysm of opinions and desires that didn't speak with each other to reach solutions and an outcome that we all wanted to be good. And at the end, we're left with no one to talk to really but ourselves. The people responsible for perpetuating the issue of a dead-end telephone society. The Cry of Man was an incredible production. Fully entertaining, very engaging, very fun, filled with humor, and exciting. The idea of having viewers call in and take part in the show was brilliant. The very concept of this being a live eight-night event was brilliant. The move to let the outcome of storylines rest on our shoulders was... incredibly risky. <laughs> really, really risky. So I can't actually call that one brilliant, but it was still truly awesome. <laughs> it's not something that you guys needed a hardcore analysis and breakdown to understand. It's not a puzzle box like much of what we've seen from Wham City Comedy but it's every bit as enjoyable, just in different ways. Like I said, if what we usually get from these guys is pie, then this time they brought us a cake. And that's just fine, their cake is also great. If you saw them on tour, you saw the cake already. You knew the cake was good. They do both constantly, pie and cake. And if their next tour comes around to a stop near you, go see them. You have been introduced to what it's like to see them live now. Cry of Man is the best sample of a Wham City tour show I can point out for you. Now, before we wrap this up, are there any loose ends to think of? I'm sure you've got some on your mind. We haven't really addressed the lemon muffins, the train, Truel Day, the color coding of the letters. And at the end, I don't think much of that really matters. Lemon muffins just seem to be part of the fictional Truel Day, and the meaning of Truel Day is pretty much any major holiday where family is supposed to be together and people make a big deal out of it, I guess. It could be a Thanksgiving, a Christmas, even a Fourth of July. The color coding of the letters is interesting, because we know that blue letters are for celebrating Truel Day, so blue is good and happy, and red letters are danger and disaster. Yellow letters are moves of power, influence, and coercion. Mix red and yellow, and what color do you get? Orange, the color of communication, a force that's a blend of danger, disaster, power, influence, and coercion. And the opposite or complementary color to orange on the color wheel? Blue. It's pretty telling that we switch over in a major clash between blue and orange lighting when Georgia first comes into the living room, scaring away Ghost Lady. There's also the bright blue shirt Tank Man wears under his suit, which isn't necessary for him to have on, because we can see that he's gone on a regular white collared dress shirt underneath already. And while I think this may have just been Ellen having fun with us dropping an easter egg referencing Ellen's tutorial, there is the moment when Jack says he used to paint in a stupid color like blue before finding orange. The train is interesting because we know it has the very odd quality of being a direct line from the railroad station to the Mann family house. Like it will literally pull right up in front of the house. Look at the model we're shown. That's kind of crazy, right? 
what could that possibly mean? I'm going to leave it as another communication metaphor, or again, the lack of communication. Members of the household don't need to really brave the outside world and walk into town. They can simply go right through the front door, hop on their personal train, and then be sheltered and carried all the way down to the station for business. Not much of a chance of encountering these people for a chat. It could also just be a visual metaphor about a phone line. Plot device, reference to the shadow over Innsmouth, which really does seem like the foundation for the Lovecraft influence here. A way of illustrating the path of man kind of being on the rails and can be knocked off by manipulative communication. Something cool for the story. It's a train, you guys. Trains are cool. If it means something more than any of these possibilities, I really don't think it's anything major. But if we find out it was, that's awesome and I would love to hear about it. And I believe that's about it. The one question that remains for me personally is how much influence we actually had on the story as callers. Which moments were we able to really affect the change or turn the storyline around? Could we have saved Courtney Mann from being poisoned? I know we could have saved Juglet, and that's extremely obvious. Barry and Martinez could have come together, and it's possible that if we led him along better, we might have been able to actually hook up Juglet and Martinez instead. Frank gave us plenty of room to influence him if we had the real answers he wanted. The key was not blue. He was just recognizing we couldn't answer that and moving on to the next question, and the one after, and the one after that. Who knows how much we could have done or learned if we'd broken the Lovecraft code early. Just another reminder of how we failed our own mass communication assignment, I suppose. When Cry of Man finished, I held an impromptu livestream in place at the time when Tagging Man would have aired and held a bit of discussion with some viewers who caught it, incorporating some of my own Patreon supporters on their personal Discord server halfway through. I was confused, conflicted, and in a mood to discuss my feelings. You guys know how I am by now. I'm always looking for the puzzle pieces, trying to get the clues, decipher the coding, pick up hidden meanings. Here's a moment during that livestream that captured my feelings in their raw form right after Tag Man's therapy session. Yeah, yeah, true. I mean, it, it, it's it's not about satisfaction. It's, you know, what, what they see and what they think is going to be awesome. And this was awesome. It was totally awesome. Mm. It's like every side of me that loves going to their shows and loves their performances and loves the creative stuff and surprising and impressive stuff they do love the hell out of this the side of me that you know wants to be classic nick nocturne and have something to peel apart and and dig up and piece together is kind of sitting here lifting my mug looking inside saying where's the f coffee <laughs> <laughs> There's no tea leaves at the bottom of this. How am I supposed to glean this? Yeah. Oh, wait, I'm drinking coffee. Yeah, exactly. That makes it more difficult. <laughs> what David of Midnight Marinara said works much better than what I did. I was trying to read tea leaves and a mug of coffee. And there's nothing wrong with being served coffee. I love coffee. Coffee is what you always get at a Wham City tour show. I just did not expect it in a big recorded project. Were there bits to decipher and solve once I got over my confusion of not seeing very much at all to solve? Yes, definitely. They just weren't major, crucial elements of the piece you needed to crack to really get what the project was about. That's all. The puzzle work serves to highlight a sub-theme in the art that's already pretty visible to the average viewer, I think. You feel smarter when you do the Lovecraft decryption work, but it just underlines a statement that you already picked up. And if you somehow didn't get that this whole project was about communication, its failings, and the illusion of viewers being these weird eldritch gods with great power through their voices before I told you, you and I need to spend a lot more time together. Or you may need to go through a few high school theater classes. Yeah, definitely go hit up your old high school theater director. They'll fix you up. In fact, go read The Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams. There's your Nightmind course homework before we go back to class on how to make a web series, okay? Go read The Glass Menagerie. I thoroughly enjoy The Cry of Man on many levels, even if I was a bit thrown off track at first. But that's because I, like many of you, had expectations keeping me tied up. Expectations are the enemy, especially when it comes to new work by any member of Wham City Comedy. Don't expect it to be anything other than something you'll enjoy in some aspect. Don't expect a puzzle box, don't even expect a full comedy show now. Just anticipate instead. Anticipate a good time. They did fantastic. I loved it, everybody else that I've spoken to who watched it loved it, and as always, I and all of my peers look forward to more. And like I said, if they go on tour again soon and they come near you, go see them. Go to the show. It's always a good time. They deserve every bit of support they can get. And even if you feel weird about it, know that you're going to be in the company of people who enjoy their work and follow it just like you do. You will be among friends, even if you don't know it. 
This is how you can make sure that Wham City Comedy gets to keep doing what they do without worrying about making ends meet or where they're going to get another chance to put a project together. Don't be afraid. Wham City doesn't bite you. Do beware of fellow audience members though, because I might be among them, and I will bite you. <laughs> but really, keep a lookout for tour dates and go to a show if it's happening near you. Follow Wham City on Twitter to stay posted. That's it for tonight, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for viewing, and give major thanks to all my supporters on Patreon, who help me keep doing what I'm doing while also building resources to assist creators in putting up their own projects. Stick around to the end to see all of their names. Thanks for joining me in the dock again this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and unlike phones without caller ID, I'll be seeing you again real soon. Sleep tight.